The Hudson Library and Historical Society presents the inaugural event in the Libby Walker Women's Studies Series. Women's Health Pioneer Judy Norsigian, co-founder and executive director of Our Bodies, Ourselves, a worldwide organization informing and inspiring women across generations. An interesting look at women's health issues in modern times. Recorded at the Hudson Library's Flood Meeting Room on December 9, 2014. Due to the adult subject matter of this presentation, only mature viewers are recommended. Good evening. I'm Gwendolyn Mayer, the archivist here at the Hudson Library and Historical Society, and I want to welcome you to this wonderful evening. Um, I have a few tiny sm announcements to make before we get into the program. Please remember that um, without the support of the Learned Owl, which is our local independent bookstore, we would not have the ability to buy our author's publications this evening. And if you look outside in the hallway, they are currently selling copies of Our Bodies Ourselves. And it is my understanding Judy will be happy to sign them afterwards, too, after she entertains some questions. Also to be noted on the side of the wall, there's a little donation box, so if your heart moves you and your wallet happens to be very full, you might want to drop some extra bills in there. They help pay for the interesting programs we have here at the Hudson Library. And speaking of paying, I put on the back table, with some things that our author put there as well, a little publication about Libby Walker. Elizabeth Walker is the whole reason um, we're here tonight. She left her estate so that we could have wonderful lectures from now until the end of time about women's issues. And this evening is the inaugural Elizabeth Walker Women's Studies program. We thought very long and hard about who would be able to speak at such a program because Libby was such a strong advocate for women. And as we all sat around and talked at the library about books that changed our lives as women, this one was the top on the list. I was five years old when this book was published, and it probably was ah, the ninth or tenth book my mother handed me. Um, when I would get bored, she'd literally hand me books, and I know that she handed me this one very early on. I think this book has changed many a woman's life, and for a woman to have such a powerful effect upon all of humanity, and especially women, you can speak no higher than of this wonderful pioneer, Judy Norsegian, who is going to speak to you this evening. She came in from Boston today. She's a, she is well known to cold weather, but I'm not certain she's always well known to Ohio's changing weather. <laughs> <laughs> she had a wonderful dinner and she is a great person. She will um, entertain questions afterwards and sign books afterwards. So once you guys all come in and get settled and get warmed up in a chair, we're going to inter have Judy come up and speak. But I want to make mention again of the fact that there's a table in the back where she put some publications and literature. There are also evaluations and information about Libby Walker. Everybody grab a chair, and then I'm going to have Judy come up and speak, because you don't want to hear me. You want to hear the wonderful Judy Norsegian. Well, thank you, Gwen, and it's really an honor to join all of you this evening. And speaking about changing weather, I almost missed my flight this morning because I underestimated what was going on in Boston this morning. Um, I do want to say that I bring greetings from all of the co-founders. This is a project that took a village. You know how it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, a group of women and a group of women who were joined by many other women and men over many, many years have not only raised this book, this baby, um, to where it is right now, it's um, really been part of launching a movement that's been something I'll talk about in a little bit. I want to say that back in 1969, at a for one of the first women's liberation conferences at Emmanuel College in Boston. Don't ask me how a Catholic school sponsored an event where there was a discussion of women and their bodies and sexuality. We still don't know the answer to that, but 
Uh, these were very progressive nuns, and I've been told by faculty who work there then that uh, you wouldn't believe what they let be taught at Emmanuel College. So back in 69, out of this conference, a group informally continued to meet, and they thought they'd put together a good doctor's list. They realized instantly they had no good information for evaluating doctors because they were so ignorant, and they had had bad experiences with the health and medical care system. So they embarked upon a process of self-education, speaking to nurses, physicians who talked to them, um, to go to the Count Wayne Medical Library at Harvard Medical School to really figure out answers to all these questions they had, whether it was around childbirth or abortion or sexually transmissible diseases or contraception. Uh, and in those days, nobody even recognized postpartum depression. Yet one or two of the women in our founding group did experience postpartum depression. So in 1970, in December, the very first newsprint edition of Our Bodies, Our Cells came out titled Women and Their Bodies. Very soon afterwards, March of 71, we realized that that was a distancing title, that really, it's not about their bodies, it's about our bodies. So the title became Our Bodies, Our Cells. And we have in the back an example of that, Gwen's holding it up. Uh, it's the same book with a different cover, and that is the moment at which we adopted the title Our Bodies, Our Cells, and we're gifting you with one of the few remaining copies of this sort of treasure. It'll be here in the library, um, yes, and I know you'll take good care of it. Um, a number of universities have copies, but it is a great project for young women and men in colleges who want to analyze the progression of our bodies ourselves. There's a lot of angry language in this first edition. Mm -hmm. Women were furious because there was so much sexism and condescension and paternalism in medical care. It was in all the institutions. It was particularly bad in medicine. So there was a lot of outrage. And what happened is that in the course of all these ensuing years, women began to share their stories, understand that it's not because men in medicine were bad. Look at their textbooks, which we did. What the textbooks said was so outrageous, we understood where it came from. It was systematically being taught. And that's where we needed to see huge amount of change. And some of it's happened. Some of it we still have a long way to go with. And I just want to say that I'm, I've kept this sort of uh, title page because it has the logo from our 40th anniversary celebration, which was held a little more than three years ago at Boston University, where we brought in about 15 of our global partners from around the world to talk about their experiences adapting and making our bodies ourselves culturally relevant for women in their region, in their country. And if you want to go online at ourbodiesourselves.org, we have the whole symposium taped with clips with panels, with discussions about what women in Turkey and in India and Armenia and Serbia and um, uh, Latin America, how they took this piece of work and transformed it to be relevant to women in their own communities. And I will say that I'm going to start in with a few covers, just so you can get a kind of quick overview. That is the copy of the book you're going to be keeping here at the library. Note its price, 40 cents. That was pretty amazing. And, um, you know, here we are, you know, 40 years later with the ninth edition of the book, probably our best ever. And I say that uh, having worked on pretty much all the editions because we corral not only 300 wonderful experts and contributors, we also had uh, new experiences working with the internet. We had a wiki conversation, for example, with a group of about 30 individuals selected from a group of 200 who had responded to an email appeal to have a conversation, sort of like a kitchen table conversation, about sexual identity and gender orientation, which became a new chapter in the book. Very interesting conversation, which is portrayed. These are two single topic books that were produced in 2006 and 8. Um, they're both um, still very useful, and we still um, think that there's value in zeroing in on some of these single topic issues, but we always like to draw the connections among the, very, the many issues. This is the cover to the Japanese edition, the second edition. This is the Thai edition. This is the Chinese edition. And in fact, it came out shortly before the, um, the UN Conference on Women. And Hillary Rodden Clinton was in Beijing. And she met the coordinator of this project there. This is a Serbian edition. And that 
picture on the cover is from their first ever Take Back the Night March in Belgrade, Serbia. And as some of you know, after many of the Serbian men came back from the rape camps, where they raped many Bosnian women, they were traumatized too, except some of them didn't know it. But what happened is they started beating and harming their wives and their children because they were so distraught. We see this all the time when people perpetrate horrible acts of violence against others, that somewhere inside them they are troubled, deeply troubled by it. And the Serbian and Bosnian women we actually worked together on some of these projects that ensued. Um, I do want to say that these are, um, this is a, a slide out of order. I was looking for it and that's where it is. It's coming up later. <laughs> this is the um, issue that we're working on most intensively right now. I'm going to get to it in a while. And it has to do with the um, phenomenon of transnational commercial surrogacy, whereby women mostly from poor countries are hired to uh, gestate babies for women largely in industrialized countries. There are many advantages to this model, but there are also huge disadvantages when the health and human rights of these women are being violated, which is the case right now, particularly in India where we know something. Uh, and then, of course, the increasing demand for women's eggs for both IVF purposes, in vitro fertilization, and for use in research. One of the things that we're deeply disturbed about is the lack of any decent long-term safety data to provide to young women who provide eggs in this way. Altruism is a primary motivation here, not, not alone. The money is good for many of these young women who need to pay for a college education or graduate school. But we believe, along with others, I'll say more about this in a little while, that we need to do much better research to have better data to provide for these young women as they make this decision. So this is the Romanian book. This is the Senegalese version for French-speaking African countries. Uh, there's actually a French-speaking, uh, a French-language edition being produced in Canada right now, which will be updated, but probably shared in some African countries. The cover of the Korean edition. This Tibetan edition was in two volumes. It was done by a group of Tibetan nuns. And of course, Tibetan nuns are supposed to be celibate. So the part about contraception and you know having babies, that's in one volume. It's not the volume that supposedly the nuns need. And the Dalai Lama himself wrote a preface to this wonderful publication. It was uh, actually midwife by a Dutch midwife who spent a lot of time in Dharamsala and who met these Tibetan nuns who said they were remarkably ignorant about their bodies and they needed to understand much more. Menstrual chaos, whatever the problems were, they were largely not related to reproduction. This is a picture of some of the older nuns with a younger nun to the right looking at the two editions of the book. The Russian edition came out early, um, very early, uh, produced by Progress Publishers. It was not an adaptation, and many years later, a group based in St. Petersburg, Russia, decided to do an adaptation, which is a completely electronic version. So if you know anyone who speaks Russian, they can go online and get the whole book that way. The reason they didn't publish a print version is that paper was so expensive in Russia at this time the book would have been prohibitively expensive. Plus, most people have access to the internet through a kiosk or whatever. So this is the Bangla edition, um, smaller than most of the other editions. But I do want to point out that Bangla is really the fourth most spoken language in the world, partly because Bangladesh, which is a very populous country, speaks mainly Bangla. And this was produced by a group in India and a group, because West Bengal also speaks um, Bangla, and a group based in New Jersey called Manavi. And their focus has been on violence against women in the South Asian community. This is the Armenian edition, the second edition, which has used a smaller format. And they chose to use the pink cover and the sort of picture format that we use for the 2005 edition of Our Bodies Ourselves. Um, it's a remarkable project led by Dr. Mary Khachikian, who has been working closely with IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation in Europe. So she spent a lot of time in Belgium, and she's also um, been a heroine of many of the younger women I've met in Armenia in my several trips there. You can imagine in a country that is basically losing population because of lack of jobs and you know, a, an inability for young people to really become economically self-sustaining. Uh, there's a lot of concern about things like 
promoting access to contraception and condoms for STI prevention. So this very brave physician was pilloried in the press and charged with a yet another form of genocide. Now, you know about the Armenian genocide, so for someone to be accused of genocide in Armenia is a very serious accusation. Of course, there's any that's far from the truth. And she and many young women and men who've been working on access to reproductive health information and resources are to be commended for standing up against what I would call um, old attitudes. So this is actually a picture of some young women being trained to do manual vacuum aspiration abortions, particularly in the rural areas where access to care is very limited. In Nigeria, there's a group called Wedger, the Women for Empowerment, Development, and Gender Reform that used um, formats such as posters on the canoe transport system to disseminate key messages about HIV AIDS and preventing HIV transmission. This was as much a peace project as well as a women's health education project. Side by side, Palestinian women and Jewish Israeli women in East Jerusalem produced Arabic and Hebrew editions. It's been a very difficult uh, process for them because of of course, it, the situation is very tense between Palestinians and Jewish Israeli um, individuals, and this project itself suffered because of that surrounding tension. But the books are available, one completely online, one partly online. Our Nepali co um, colleagues have produced seven booklets because they needed to work in rural areas. Most of the uh, in the Pali female population doesn't live in Kathmandu or the few of the cities. They live in very rural areas. And they have um, also joined with us on a project that is trying to um, educate women about some of the issues regarding a transnational commercial surrogacy. Because as Indian women become too expensive for the brokers who are engaged in finding gestational mothers in other countries, they're looking to Nepal where women get paid less to become such gestational mothers. This is a screenshot from a web page um, by Mavi Kalam. These are our Turkish colleagues based in Istanbul. And they were supposed to have their book already out, but you know a little bit about what's going on in Turkey and the prime minister's attack on women's rights and um, the problems that they're having are uh, too many to even begin. So this group, Mavi Kalam, and many other women's rights organizations have been focusing on those issues right now, and so the book is not quite done, but hopefully will be done soon. And this is the wonderful cover to the Spanish language adaptation put out in 2000. So what are some of the global challenges facing women's health and human rights advocates today? This first one is becoming a global problem, though initially it was probably more a problem in industrialized countries. It's happening everywhere. To see this increasing sexualization of young women, particularly young girls, and the narrow norm of what constitutes the ideal body type has generated a, a whole host of problems, such as eating disorders, such as um, uh, a clamor for certain kinds of body-altering surgery, cosmetic surgery. It's become harder and harder to be happy with the body you've been given. And I'm not talking about um, extreme forms of um, you know, body differences. I'm talking about what we would 10 years, 20 years ago have thought of as normal body types. More intensive and sweeping attacks on reproductive rights and justice than we have ever seen in many years. I don't have to say much about that. It's in the news all the time. And violence against women and girls. So um, a few years ago, we decided to do something about the fact that the cohort of women least likely to vote in American elections were young, unmarried women. Uh, I don't know why that is, except that when I went to my own niece, who was then 18, and I said, isn't this terrific? You can get to vote. Uh, and I've been very close to her since my late brother died when she was nine years old, and now she's 20. And she said, vote? Politics is boring. I haven't registered. And here I am, her aunt, and I'm thinking, uh-oh. We have a problem. Not only that, she said none of her friends were registering to vote. And then she mentioned a young man in, a man in their class. She's not from, you know, right around Boston. It's a more rural area. I wouldn't say that there, it's the most intellectual community. And she said, there's this guy in my class, and I like him a lot, but he keeps telling us that we should pay attention to politics and that we should register and we should vote. And I'm thinking, where's their civics class? Well, of course, we know a lot of civics courses have gone out the window. 
Long story short, I gave her a little lecture on what's at stake in that particular election, and she was, every other sentence, no way, really? And she went out and registered the next week, all her friends registered, and they voted. Because as young women, they saw what was at stake. But it was a wake-up call for many of us that we have not been paying attention to the fact that young women largely, you know, they're in their chats, they're, you know, they're texting, you know, they're in these sort of really refined areas where they visit on the web, but they don't watch television except for reality TV shows or whatever. They don't read the newspapers and they don't listen to the radio in terms of news. They might listen to music. And so we have a very largely well uh, undereducated group of women and maybe young men as well, but I certainly know this was true for women. So we began this campaign and highlighted four top issues. Things like allowing employers to deny insurance coverage for care they disagree with, permitting doctors to withhold vital medical information, personhood amendments, and mandating medically unnecessary procedures. Uh, when you really get into the details of some of these proposals, many of which have passed state by state, you see just how much they have a potential to harm women's health. So Our Bodies, Our Votes was a, basically a bumper sticker campaign, but people decided to put these bumper stickers everywhere. Um, there's a student in a college campus. Um, and then one of the reporters who wrote about the Our Bodies, Our Votes campaign said, you know, you need an Educate Congress campaign because you know where some of the biggest ignorance is? It's in our Congress. Mm -hmm. So we did an Indiegogo campaign and we raised money to buy a copy of Our Bodies, Ourselves for every member of the House and the Senate. <laughs> and, um, we decided to um, do some symbolic deliveries. Most of them were mailed. This is um, um, a gentleman, Gary Peters from Michigan, and he's a senator, but he was a representative then. Yes, and a very nice man. And to his right is Christy Turlington Burns. Remember her on the cover of Vogue? Those of you who are old enough will remember. Very famous model. Well, Christy's gone on to get an MPH, and she's still getting it, from uh, Columbia University. And she founded an organization called Every Mother Counts, trying to reduce maternal mortality globally. And to her right is Erin, who's her executive director. And we decided to combine forces and talk about reducing in, uh, maternal mortality, and, per, and that is their sort of um, DVD that describes their work, and to get the book out to members of Congress. And to my left are two young interns from the National Women's Health Network. They helped me walk the halls of Congress with these heavy books, and I'll never do that again. But um, they, we had numbers of members in both the House and Senate that stored the boxes, but picking them up and carting them around were very exhausting. And there's the end of the day at 6.30 where I am with a colleague, Diane Zuckerman and Elizabeth Warren, um, you know, sharing the petition about um, the Every Mother Counts effort and talking with her about, this is very early on, she had just been elected, about what she can do on behalf of women's health. And we also have been very active in this whole arena of advancing best practices in maternal and child health. And you've got a great resource right here, Margie, who's right sitting in the front. If any of you want to um, talk to Margie Greenberg afterwards, she's been doing a great job educating residents and working in the field and writing books um, that promote best practices as well. And we decided to take on um, three big issues because one of the uh, mentors we have at the Boston University School of Public Health said, you can't have a list longer than three items or nobody will pay attention. So it was very hard for us, but we did. And so we decided to preserve and expand the option of vaginal births after cesarean. Because when women don't have the option of so-called VBAC, that drives the cesarean rate up unnecessarily. Women ought to have the option of having a trial of labor. And it's unfortunate that many communities saw access to VBACs dwindling, and we're trying to see um, reverse that trend right now. We also wanted to expand hospital-based midwifery care so that more women across the country would have access to certified nurse midwives, and in a few states they also have certified who have essentially the same training. And then we wanted to promote licensing and regulation of certified professional midwives, so-called CPMs, to make the option of home birth as safe as possible. CPMs mostly do home births, but in some states they are actually staff freestanding birth centers as well. Um, but they are trained primarily in out-of-hospital birth, which, as you know or may not know, is growing slightly in the United States. 
We also got very active in an issue that was um, brought to our attention by a law professor at Chicago Kent Law, Lori Andrews, who convinced the ACLU to bring a class action suit. It was a lawsuit against actually Myriad Genetics and also a research outfit in Utah and um, Myriad um, Genetics. It was originally also including the US Patent and Trade Office, but that was dropped. We opposed the patenting of human genes. And many researchers joined in on this lawsuit as well because they said this patent that Myriad Genetics had was infringing upon their right to improve upon the BRCA1 and 2 testing and also to do the research they were trying to do. So um, this lawsuit included plaintiffs, including organizations. And by the way, there are two nonprofit women's health advocacy groups, Our Bodies, Our Cells, and Breast Cancer Action, based in San Francisco individual researchers, and then some women who felt they were personally harmed by lack of access to a better test. Um, so I want to, I'm leaving this PowerPoint with you. It has some slides at the end I'm not going to go over, but I'm leaving it with you. It'll be here at the library. For those of you who are very interested in short one and two page briefs about so many of the reproductive justice issues that confront us now, what's happening to women in prisons, what's happening to women who are homeless, what's happening to women in many, many um, sectors of our communities, particularly disadvantaged women. This is a phenomenal resource, and it isn't a print publication. It's only available online. Um, I'm going to raise this issue because we have partnered with a filmmaker to raise attention, particularly about use of breast implants for augmentation, cosmetic surgery only. Um, some of you may know that most of the cosmetic surgery patients are, are women, most are white, most are repeat patients, and two-thirds of uh, report family incomes under $50,000. What this means is that a lot of women in particular go into credit card debt to um, have the cosmetic surgery done that they choose. It's of course more popular on the West Coast. This is partly because of Hollywood. But the highest per capita use of breast implants in the country is not in California. Can you guess what state? Arizona. Texas. Texas. Yes. <laughs> Well, Houston is the home of the silicone gel breast implant. It was developed there. Um, there's some very interesting statistics, and you can get them from even the um, American Society of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgeons. Go to their website. We have started um, a project of showing, actually, this is several years in the making, um, and we've been doing this with the filmmaker, showing this wonderful documentary, and I'm going to be sending the film to the library as a gift so you can show it here sometime. Um, you don't really um, need someone to be a facilitator. It's an extraordinary film which very even-handedly presents pros and cons, and it follows a woman who seeks explantation and a woman who seeks implantation. Um, both are happy with their decisions. So it leaves, but it also covers some very interesting Food and Drug Administration hearings where testimony was given and some of the implant manufacturers are grilled by some of the FDA advisory committee members. That's instructive in and of itself. So I'm, I'm leaving this here as a reminder that you know you will have this to show sometime. Maybe the filmmaker can come from New York or I can come and we can facilitate a conversation. Mostly we show this in college campuses and we invite community members to come as well and we've had a phenomenal response. This is another documentary I love because it is so funny. Uh, it was done by a woman who didn't set out to do this, and it's basically a documentary about the hunt, hunt for the pink Viagra. And it shows the influence of the pharmaceutical industry on this whole discourse about um, seeking a drug for something we call female sexual dysfunction. Much more complicated discussion than I can get into now, but I do encourage you to show this film sometime just because it's so funny and it's very um, useful as well. So I'm going to get now to this issue of um, the question of egg retrieval for pay. People call it egg donation, but it's not. Very few women donate their eggs, sometimes for family members or friends. Most women are paid anything from five to seven thousand dollars, which is usually the limit recommended by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, all the way up to a hundred thousand dollars plus. There have been ads in college papers for women who have the right attributes, and couples seeking women with the right attributes will pay quite a bit of money for those eggs. And then the phenomenon of transnational commercial surrogacy. 
So I'm not going to say too much about this, um, but I just want you to know that I've got a lot of slides in here. Um, there are some interesting um, intersections, and there's a failure to provide the kind of evidence and information that we really need, uh, and a failure to honor the health and human rights, say, of women in other countries. And let me give you a good example. India is now considering a law that would require a gestational mother who's agreed to have a baby for someone in another country require her to undergo a cesarean section. Yes, yes. That is not in the best interest of mother or baby. But it, there is a convenience factor here. Now, our close colleague, Sama Resource Group for Women in Health, based in Delhi, is fighting this. And they're really pushing hard for a revision of that particular language. There are a few other parts to this so-called ART legislation. It hasn't passed yet. But some of the proposals are outrageous. And what they reflect is a bias towards the interest of the commissioning parents or others, but not necessarily the health and well-being of the gestational mothers, and I would add the babies, the babies in all of this. Think about them. So we've, I'm listing here many of the concerns for egg providers. The egg providers are largely coming from industrialized countries, and we do not have enough evidence. The National Perinatal Association earlier this year issued a very strongly worded statement calling for much better research and much better transparency and for changing the way in which, for example, IVF um, is done. And to its credit, the um, there are a few places, like the University of Michigan, which has a big medical center, where they have said, we're going to follow best practices, even though it's a recommendation of the ASRM, it's largely not followed. And that is that if you are 35 and under, we're only going to do what we call single embryo transfer. Because when you do two, three embryo transfers, you're more likely to have twins born. And we know there are many serious problems associated with twin births that you can largely avoid by having singleton births. And you, if you are in that age group, they are going to basically not be covering. You can find someone who'll do it and pay for it, but they won't cover it through third party insurance because it does not represent a best safe practice. Um, and the other thing that we're very concerned about is that there's two sets of drugs that are used when women undergo egg retrieval. There's a first set of drugs that basically shuts down ovarian function, after which you have controlled hyperstimulation of the ovaries and you produce multiple follicles, multiple eggs. And the first set of drugs are the drugs that actually most concern me, because we have not done very much good longitudinal study. Um, one of the drugs that's frequently used, called luprolide acetate or Lupron, is on the market for other approved uses, not for this use. And that is a very commonly used drug to suppress ovarian function. And a lot of women have um, found one another on the internet and have really been pushing for better data to be collected because they've had serious problems with Lupron. And nobody's following these women systematically except for one of the best kept secrets in this country, which is a nationwide voluntary um, database. It's a registry based out of Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Hanover, New Hampshire. It's called IFRR-registry.org. They're encouraging participants at fertility clinics, including women who provide eggs, um, to contribute information to this growing database so researchers will have more material to work with. And we're working with them to increase participation because even though the ASRM, uh, American Society for Reproductive Medicine, gives a grant to Dartmouth-Hitchcock to um, run this database, they do very little to promote participation. And so most clinics, and we've had some interns who've decided as a project to contact them, we're more than 300 fertility centers around the country. The vast majority do not even put the placard up for this um, registry so that somebody walking in the waiting room would even know about it. That's all you have to do. And one does not need an IRB, an institutional review board, because you can use the review board at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Dartmouth it's a very interesting problem, and it's made me wonder whether some of these fertility centers are really that interested in collecting the best data that we should have on hand. Um, and so we have partnered with a group called We Are Egg Donors. We didn't know about them until two years ago. These are women who formerly provided eggs, mostly for fertility purposes. Uh, some had serious problems, some didn't. 
but they all knew women of their age cohort who had serious problems and were not well treated by the clinics who asked them to provide eggs for these purposes. So they formed a group and they are now interviewing large numbers of women who have been egg donors to get more of the stories out there and they're calling for greater for greater attention to the research questions that have not been addressed yet. So we're hoping that with their advocacy and with the advocacy of the National Perinatal Association and possibly some other OBGYN leaders who are looking at this issue and really deeply disturbed by what they see, we'll get more public attention. Um, and I'm going to just leave this out uh, to things that, with links that you can uh, learn more about if you want. Uh, these are many of the concerns that we've been raising. And this particular project that we've embarked upon with our gr partner group in Nepal, Warwick, and with Sama, based in New Delhi, and the Center for Genetics and Society, based in Berkeley, California, has been funded recently by the MacArthur Foundation. So we're both collecting data, um, mostly about what we do and don't know is happening in the field. And then we hope to move with that information to get better policies. One thing that's so interesting, and in all of these debates, not enough attention is given to the risk to children, whether resulting from IVF or what. And there was a discussion at The Hague just this past um, August, um, and a, a, a particular, I'm going to get to that slide in a second. Um, let's skip all of these. Uh, this is what we're doing. The International Forum on Intercountry Adoption and Surrogacy. They decided that they needed to look at surrogacy as an issue, and they brought together activists from uh, several dozen countries for a forum that produced some very interesting findings. In fact, some were coming from the labor force participation perspective and looking at this as they looked at um, the challenges facing sex workers. Many people do not want to see prostitution banned, but they would like to see uh, access to um, sex worker opportunities that are safer for women. Uh, this is very difficult to achieve and this is a huge debate. But there were people coming from very different disciplines looking at the question of inter-country adoption and surrogacy and what we might need to do to establish policies not only within a country but between countries. Maybe we need some global agreement on what is and isn't appropriate. So this was the beginning of a global conversation that we will hear more about. Um, the takeaways from the Hague Forum I think are worth mentioning here. Many considered, not many, some considered commercial surrogacy unacceptable on the grounds that it commodifies and commercializes both babies and women's reproductive capacities or because of health and human rights risks. Others believe that surrogacy is a form of labor and should be handled by improving labor conditions for gestational mother. Uh, and this perspective was mainly voiced by researchers who have spent considerable time with gestational mothers themselves, including women in India. Women in India who do this do not see themselves as victims. You have to understand that for many of them, what they make in that nine months producing a baby for a couple somewhere is more than their husbands could make in five years. It's a significant source of income. They can buy a home or they can put their children through school. So it's not something that many of us think is appropriate to ban, but we certainly want to see their rights respected and certainly don't want to see mandates to have cesarean sections. Um, and then adoptees who've worked in adoption reform were extremely concerned about children born of these practices and the decades of work in the adoption field, especially regarding preservation of records and open adoption, would be undone in surrogacy agreements which are taking place in an open global market without regulation. Now, one thing we have learned from the phenomenon of uh, children born through various arrangements, particularly where there's been donor sperm, but also donor eggs. They have found one another. They have an organization that has 25,000 members. And the vast majority of them believe that if adults engage in these kinds of practices, that it is their obligation to retain information about all the parents, genetic, gestational, and social. Obviously, if you're an adoptive parent, your, your kid knows you. But that it's your obligation to retain this information so that when a child turns 21, if that child wants to find out more about a genetic parent, uh, that that information will be there. We are 
convinced most of us who have been following the, the practices in adoption that this is important. There are countries, by the way, around the world, many in Europe, that do not allow a young man to donate his sperm or get paid for it, you get a small amount of money, unless you sign a document that says you are willing to be contacted when any offspring from your sperm, if they are produced, um, that they can contact you. And they do believe this is a right for all children. In the United States, this has been raised in several states even, and it is shot down all the time. And it's, it's interesting to me that we fail to think about what the offspring themselves are saying about the meaning of this. This is about your roots, who you are. And when you turn 21, why shouldn't you be able to have that information about your roots? And one of, this, one of the things we have to think about is we expand what we call the whole field of practices in ART, assisted reproductive technology. Um, uh, we are working uh, with the Center for Genetics and Society to identify the international legal and human rights principles that should be followed in transnational commercial surrogacy and egg retrieval for pay, and to identify practices that satisfy these principles. And we would like to identify international medical standards that should be followed and to identify best medical practices. And we're going to be working with global and domestic partners to advance this goal. And there's more about this project at our website. Um, these are, you know, for me, key issues. The lack of adequate safety data for many infertility drugs and the proliferation of misleading ads and marketing schemes to increase both demand and supply. And the latest example is the recent spate of media coverage for egg freezing. How many of you saw that? Very little attention at all given to the risks that might be associated. It was all about whether the employer should pay for it, is it a good idea, is it a bad idea, and it was only somewhat later, maybe two or three weeks into this debate, that a few magazines, Wired Magazine, uh, was um, Forbes, uh, maybe the, a list of five or six, CNN I think was one of them that had an online piece written by three sociologists from Yale. Um, that actually address the full gamut of issues. We have an excellent blog that links to all these articles if you're interested in this. Um, this is the link for the, this is a screenshot from the Infertility Family Research Registry. And if you want to show another great documentary, it's a full length feature documentary that explores the phenomenon of outsourcing surrogate motherhood to India. It's called Made in India. It was produced by two young filmmakers in New York City, one of them Indian, and it's beautifully done, and it does not um, cast blame anywhere. It simply presents some of the dilemmas we faced. It's very sympathetic towards the Texas couple who is seeking to have a child, and it's also very sympathetic towards some of the situations that the women in India face. This is another film, much shorter, that we can send to you because we have copies. It's a DVD that our colleagues, some are commissioned, and this looks much more at commercial um, surrogacy through the eyes of the gestational mothers. Again, they do not see themselves as victims at all. It's very important to understand that this is not a sort of a clear white and black issue. It's much more nuanced. Um, they also have a wonderful study called Birthing a Market, and most, if not all, of their publications are online, complete as PDF files, not just print books. So I'm going to close with a few slides about issues that I think are so important. No matter where you go, and if you look at the major women's UN conferences, when you ask women what is the greatest threat to their health and well-being, it's not lack of access to medical care. It's none of the things you might think about. It's violence. That's the biggest threat to their lives and their well-being. And I want to highlight the fact that some men have stepped up to the plate to be part of the solution, not always part of the problem. And this started really back with the White Ribbon Campaign, founded in Montreal. How many of you are familiar with the infamous Montreal Massacre? Some of you know about it. So this was in 89. A very disturbed man walked into the Polytechnic Institute where for the first time women were being allowed in to study engineering. They had been excluded because of discrimination. And this is partly because of affirmative action efforts, both in the U.S. and in Canada. So he got the men to leave the room and he shot every one of the women, killed every one of them. And it was either 16 or 17 women, something like that. And he left a note 
explaining how they had took his place in that institution. So the men decided they needed to do something about this. This is insane. You know, what are we teaching young men that they feel that women are the problem in this way? Obviously, he was deranged. But we have seen so many examples of violence against women that I think come from the cultural teachings or a lack of good cultural teachings. And anyway, they started this and it's grown to be a campaign in 55 countries. The UN project called um, um, uh, Men Engage has projects all over the world. And at the Committee on the Status of Women meetings this coming March at the UN in New York, you will see some men from those projects speaking about their work. In Massachusetts, we have now something called the White Ribbon Day campaign. It started out with simply an event at the State House in Boston. Now there are events all over the state, sometimes on White Ribbon Day, which is the first Thursday in March. Sometimes it's another day. And men take this pledge. And men from all walks of life are stepping up to the plate. So we're getting prominent athletes. We're getting um, men from law enforcement. We're getting um, fathers, sons. We're getting college students. We're getting uh, everyone who's willing to think about how they can be part of the solution, not just part of the problem, to do something in the community. This is uh, one of the White Ribbon Day campaigns with a, um, the Deval Patrick, who um, is about to leave as the governor of Massachusetts, and the late Paul Salucci, a wonderful man who took up violence against women. And by the way, he's a Republican governor who was extremely active on this issue and one of the first major sponsors of doing something about violence against women. He also was a big midwifery supporter. And I served on a small committee to write the guidelines for freestanding birth centers in Massachusetts. And he was a representative in the House and one of the few representatives who understood about midwives. So he has been a long-standing friend of women's health advocates. This is a big, big um, billboard that men in Gloucester um, cart out every July when they have a march, an annual march, to promote um, Gloucester men against domestic abuse. And there are more communities doing this kind of thing. Uh, there's an innovative a group based at University of Massachusetts. You ought to get them here. They have a little, uh, they have a few clips of what they do. There's one called Hugology 101, which I love. It's very funny, but it's really also very serious, trying to get young men to engage in some of the myths around men and masculinity. And they're, they can be brought in to a college campus, a community, and usually four men do a skit and uh, engage in a conversation um, that really can make a difference on a college campus in particular. This is a fabulous magazine. I hope you will get this, get all the back issues. They, it's based out of Western Massachusetts. They have phenomenal articles written by mostly men around the country, sometimes other countries. And many of these back issues are PDF files as well. So I want to leave one bit of reading for you. This is a book that's not that well known, but it's one of the most important books written in the last few years. It's called Sex and World Peace. And it documents how the extent of vi violence committed against females is the major determinant of whether or not a country is violent within itself or more willing to use military violence against those in other countries. It is an indicator more important than poverty, natural resources, or the degree of democracy. And the researchers were astounded when they came upon this finding. It's a book well worth reading. And although Teen Voices no longer exists, it is now being run by Women's E! News in New York City. And the local mentoring and teaching of writing in Boston has been taken up by Write Boston. Um, if you've never heard of Teen Voices magazine, I urge you to look it up. Uh, it's a phenomenal resource. And it continues to um, provide mentoring for young women who want to be writers. So there's a little bit about our website. Um, I, I'm going to um, open it up for questions now. But before I do that, I want to say one thing about our bodies or cells. And you're the first public setting in which we have um, shared this news. Uh, for some time, we have been looking to identify a well-aligned merger partner. And this is partly because I plan to step down at the end of this month to work more on climate change. It's been a I was going to say a passion, but really it's an obsession for more than you know, three or four years. And it isn't just my own 
coming to realize how important this issue is. It's a lot of young people in college campuses who have said, your generation really has to do much more than you have been doing, and you have to join with us on this issue because it's the most consequential issue of our time. And so in order to make time to do that, I want to step down. I'll still work on some of these projects, and I'll help with fundraising for Our Bodies or Cells work. But in the meantime, we're looking, and we've, we're close to identifying a really good, well-aligned partner where the work can go forward with our staff members. And uh, this uh, effort is described in a single piece of paper in the back. It's folded up. It's an appeal. And one of the things we need, because we can't go to foundations as we typically do, until we've got um, public naming of this partner. So we're seeking support from individuals uh, to build up our transition funds so that we will have a bridge from here to there. Um, I think we may know in a few months, but meanwhile we are really hopeful we'll get as many contributions, particularly one-time contributions, that will help build this bridge from where we are now to a new institutional home. Last week we just got an anonymous $25,000 contribution. If we just had a few more like this, we would be fine because our budget is not that large. We've been um, for most of our existence, not much more than half a million dollars. Nobody believes it because we are so well known and the Library of Congress named the book as one of 88 books that shaped America and Time Magazine said it's one of a hundred of the most influential nonfiction books in English written since 1923 and many kudos for the work in the book but we have always been a very small staff and mostly we've depended upon our colleagues and our friends and the experts out there who've worked with us um, as a volunteer effort people like Margie as a matter of fact who've read materials and commented and made the book as, as evidence-based and as good as it is. So I'm, I'm making that pitch along with, you know, um, supporting all the other things you do. Uh, this is an important moment to support this kind of work, particularly um, as we make stronger links between the global and domestic advocacy that has to happen. So now it's time for you. Your, yes? Can we get Margie to stand up? Yes, Margie, you should stand up. I've been naming you. they got to know who you are. Yay. question. It can be about any issue. I have not addressed many issues that I could have. Of course Susan has a question. <laughs> I have a hundred questions. In, in your um, career here with this organization, what do you think is the most um, profound change that you made or or taught women about themselves or, uh, you know that has to do with women's health well I think the most profound change has been the idea that women can be knowledgeable ultimately we're the best experts men and women of our own bodies but we grew up in an amazingly problematic environment where even asking a question of a physician was considered an insult. By the way, when we started, 98% of OBGYNs were male, 90% of all physicians were male, and their attitudes were problematic at best, even well-meaning physicians. And this is, as I said, a product of training. So I would say the um, the idea that I think is well embedded in society, that we have a right to ask questions, that we should become educated about our bodies, our health, and medical care. I think that's the biggest thing. What we didn't anticipate back then, and what is a new problem, is the way in which so much of what you read on the internet is not evidence-based, and in fact, it has commercial origins, very often a drug company, that is primarily about selling a product and not about getting the best information out there. So we've taken to um, encouraging people to find out the source of the information, who pays for it, where it comes from. It's both at our website and in our books. You need to know who is peddling the information you're reading. It's very important. And sometimes drug companies can put out good information, but a lot of it is not. And some of the websites you see may be drug company funded, but that's not immediately obvious. So uh, you have to be quite careful. And there was this, you know, ridiculous campaign called Even the Score, which was drug company funded about how we so desperately need a Viagra-like drug for women that was, yes, of course, there is a biomedical reason for some 
female sexual dysfunction. But the much larger reason for women's sexual dissatisfaction has to do with lack of understanding about their bodies or about not such good relationship, not a mutual understanding of sexual needs that can go in both directions, but it's really a much bigger problem than a sort of plumbing issue. And it isn't always a biomedical issue, it's very often a social issue that's at root that the problem. And so that's the kind of thing we try to draw attention to, to educate, that's our challenge right now, to really understand where good information comes from, and we are committed to evidence-based information, even while we recognize that that isn't going to be the sole or the supreme driving force in how we make our decisions. We have other factors that come in besides what the evidence show us, shows us. So that's what we, you know, we try to balance. Other questions? Thank you for coming. Um, I find myself thinking about our situation here in Hudson where we are represented by a retrograde female Republican representative who is very active in um, attacking women's rights to choose. And I just wondered, um, I, I find myself perplexed by these women <laughs> on the Republican side pushing this uh, frame of reference and just wondered, is there any common ground or on what what basis can you appeal to these folks? Because um, I think a lot of their, a lot of their uh, canons is, is religious based and I, I, I don't think that what that they're doing is helping particularly low income women. Well, first of all, let me say that there are many Republican women who strongly support choice in these matters. They don't want the government interfering in these uh, incredibly important decisions. Some of them even support public funding of access to things like contraception um, and a range of reproductive health services. So it, even though that's largely what you hear, and I will say also that the Republican Party is so different from what it was 20 years ago. Um, it has been hijacked. I have many Republican friends who are um, very upset by what they see. And their best example is the anti-science um, stance towards um, climate change. Um, they are horrified by the unwillingness to look at the science. And uh, some of these are pretty prominent individuals, one of whom told me quietly that he changed his vote based on that issue alone because he is committed to good science. Um, even though he has very conservative views. That was actually more important to him than the choice issues, interestingly enough. I think that women in some communities have been successful in raising awareness about how access to reproductive health care is so essential to women being able to be good mothers, being able to put food on the table, being able to, you know, get education and training. It, it's, it's just so many ways in which this is good for everybody. But this issue is never going to go away. That, I mean, there are people who truly believe that abortion is a form of killing. You know, and it's not killing a person like you and me, but it's killing life in some form. So it's a deeply moral issue for many people. And I remember debating someone on this issue. And I, I said in the end, I said, you know, I appreciate your view. And what I would say is, I ask you to use moral suasion in trying to convince people that your views are the right views. But we shouldn't be using politics and we shouldn't be interfering with these deeply personal decisions. And, and I said, you know, I'm someone who doesn't um, believe in um, killing, you know, in the sense that we do. But I do believe in some forms of killing, like if we have a justified war and we're sending people out there to fight, they're fighting to kill. I'm not a true pacifist, so that's a time I see this justified killing. And I also believe that you have a right to kill in self-defense. That's another case where I believe it's justified. Um, so for most of us, I think we do accept killing in some narrow respects. And I would be the last to say abortion, you know, it is a kind of killing, though it's not killing a person. But that doesn't mean it's immoral or wrong. And if you look at what's happened to women's lives when you deny them access to contraception and access to abortion, you are doing damage not only to them, but their children and their families. I mean, we've, we've got so many studies 
that show the harm that's done. That it's got to be left to be a personal decision. And we've got to have a society that will support women in those personal decisions. And as poverty grows and the income gap gap is growing, we are now heading towards an oligarchy, as many of you know. Um, we're going to see this as a bigger and bigger crisis. So all I can say is you have to vote your conscience if you believe that personhood amendments are good. You should go out there and fight for them. If you don't think they're good, you should go out and fight on the opposite side. I remember debating on this question of cloning um, at Yale University, their, their big debate they have. And um, there was a, and I won the debate. It was very interesting for, I mean, it's a long story, but there was a young woman from Mississippi who got up and said that she had supported the personhood amendment there. Now it didn't pass because the physicians in Mississippi opposed it and they got to the governor within two weeks of the election and he came out against it. It might have passed otherwise. Uh, and what was interesting is that she gave an argument that most of the students there um, did not agree with at all. And they, you know, they made their views known, but, but she felt entitled to speak her mind, which I think is good. You need to have a society in which everyone is entitled to speak their mind. But it doesn't mean that you know, everyone's going to agree with you. And it, the thing that disturbs me is when we create public policies and pass laws, that seem wrong-headed in the long term. Um, you know, you can think about the, um, the Keystone XL pipeline as something that's created a tremendous amount of debate. And in the long run, is this a good policy? Is this a good idea? Or is this short-sighted? Um, it's another good example. Other questions? You have something to say? I don't believe that a fetus has any more personhood than a corporation does. And I don't think that, that you know, these same issues all tie together. And, and I just, I, I think that I, I, as an actual person, that my rights should be, you know, taken into account rather than a fetus. That's versus right. I'm definitely with you on that. I think a person is a person, and I don't think corporations should be identified as people. We've been giving corporations way too much protection, um, totally. And I think that that is a case that's being made by the American Civil Liberties Union and other large organizations. And if you believe that, you need to support these groups because we are seeing such polarization. And um, my big beef right now is the way in which I see the Koch brothers buying up media and actually selling lies on public television. Not public television, um, commercial television. Although they have done some censorship in PBS, which I don't know if you followed it, but they've managed to censor some things in PBS, which is a very bad sign for us as a democracy. Other questions? If there are no more. Oh, there's, there's one, one here. More. Um, I wanted to ask about if you could talk a little bit about where you were at the very beginning, what brought you all together, and what were the issues you were facing? Well, the very beginning, as I said earlier, um, the group met and continued to meet out of uh, a women's liberation conference, and they were women of all ages, and they'd had different experiences. One had had a um, bad experience with a childbirth, one had had a postpartum depression, one had had an illegal abortion, which was a terrible experience. And they wanted to educate themselves so that they could be better informed. And then they realized that everybody needed this information. This newsprint edition sold 250,000 copies by word of mouth. That tells you something about the need for this information. And the tone in this book is actually kind of angry. Um, and very, we don't have that kind of, um, you know, vituperative language in the current editions. Uh, it's, it shows just how upset women were to be mistreated, the level of discrimination, the lack of access to information, and then to realize that good information wasn't even being gathered about so many of these issues. We were amongst many groups calling for better information, the Women's Health Initiative, you know, and getting women at NIH who cared about doing this research. For a long time, you know, research was done on mostly white males, and the, it was extrapolated to females, particularly around heart health issues, and we've learned a lot about how men and women are different, and, and research has to be conducted in different ways to take sex differences into account. Even those, you know, sleeping pills, now we know the same amount of drug, you know, the same size body in a woman or a man, you know, the woman is affected quite differently by the same amount of that drug. And so the labeling has changed, the FDA has changed the labeling. 
Um, I'm not sure everyone's reading that, so uh, some women are overdosing on these sleeping aids. Yes? Well, I just wanted to make a comment about the part of your discussion about men, because I grew up in a household with two men who were way generations ahead of their time, both educators, both very involved in child care. You know, and I'm 62 years old. Gave us baths, read us stories, put us to bed, took care of us, when, you know, did all of those, quote, maternal sorts of things. And I'm kind of persuaded that un unless we can persuade the other half of the righteousness of this cause, it's, a, it's an uphill battle, which is not to say that this movement hasn't done a great deal in you know, the 50 years that I've been an adult and, and watching the women's movement. But until men cooperate with it and men are persuaded that this is the way to go, it's, it's really hard. You know, the men are still in control of the pharmaceutical companies, they're still in control of the research, they're still, frankly, in control of Congress. And I notice there are, what, four men here? <laughs> so that's a concern to me. Well, you're right. And particularly when it comes to violence, men have to be stepping up to the plate. I think they are. Um, it's hard to do that work. Um, you don't often get support and approval from your peers. When I think about the men I know who've been the primary child rearers in their families, you know, when they go to the playground with their kids and, you know, they're very happy about what they do, they often get made fun of. What's the matter? Can't you get a real job? I mean, they, that's even in this day and age, men who are feeling very good about doing this kind of um, sharing of, you know, housework, child rearing, sometimes taking the major role, they come up against uh, a lot of negative attitudes. But that's the point that I'm making. No, but, but the. That's right. But the more of them who are willing to step up to the plate, and as that cohort grows, we will see gradual change in attitudes. That's the only way change is going to happen. When we get a bunch of brave guys willing to, you know, be more egalitarian across the board. And in some cases, you know, you don't have to, you know, have one person being the primary whatever, but you can share the roles and you can talk about that and you can be role models. And you know, the one of the, you know, the, the athletic director at Northeastern University gets all 250 athletes into a room in the beginning of the year. And he, one of his lectures is about, you know, you have a great date the night before, and great things happen. The next day in the locker room, we don't want to hear about it. That's between you and your date, and you're, you've got more class than that. Because, of course, the kinds of so meat talk, you know, that mm -hmm. happens in locker rooms is pretty disgusting. And he said, we're not going to have that on our campus. And he set a precedent, and he's a role model. And this is a guy who's very well respected in the field. He wants to help change the attitudes. When there were two hockey players accused of rape at Boston University, the president responded by opening up um, a sexual assault and response prevention center involving men and women and making this a campus-wide thing. Everybody's going to talk about this issue, and we're not going to tolerate this. You know, we've seen too many examples of the athletes getting off scot-free. I was just at the University of Miami, Florida International University. The stories they told me boggled my mind, worse than things that have happened in Boston. And they've said, until we stop this climate in which there's impunity for people who are committing with witnesses these actual criminal acts, and they get away with it, we're not going to be in good shape. So the leadership at universities um, have to be willing to lose revenue from some of the athletic events. They have to be willing to take a hit in a way that hurts the pocketbook so that we set a precedent and that we set, um, you know, we set standards for how we're going to behave. And, but all I'm saying is that requires converting men, not women. Yes, and, but, women. and I want to say that men respond to women and that's why some of the men are stepping up to the plate. But what I've watched lately is that men are also responding to other men. And it, that's why I think we need more men involved. And it's, uh, it's for the whole arena. But on the question of violence, I think it's a little bit easier because many men are now bystanders. They're actually not 
committing acts of violence, but they see it around them and they're not doing what they could do. And that's where men need to be more engaged. And I think we're seeing it, it's slow, but we've got to support it. Every community should have a group of men who are going to do a white ribbon day kind of thing. It should be something that we're proud of and we support. And, and it just takes a small group of men with a whole bunch of people around them supporting them and then it'll grow. I'm going to stop here and help hope you will join me in thanking Judy. She will go to the rotunda as usual for reception and signing of her books. So please help me thank her for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs>to the management and staff of the Hudson Library and Historical Society for their assistance in the production of this program and for providing the Libby Walker Women's Studies series for the citizens of Hudson. For a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this or any HCTV program, contact Hudson Cable Television at 330-653-2500 or via email at hctv at hudson.oh.us.